We're here at MOAD, the Museum of Australian Democracy, from here in the nation's capital, Canberra. My name is Andy and I've got you today as we explore this building on our digital program. And we're going to focus on some authentic stories from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who worked in this building, who visited this building, who campaigned in this building for things like change. This is not a comprehensive account of all history regarding Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. It is an introduction to the history of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people within our democracy and their experiences when advocating for change. This place, as some of you may know, was the seat of federal parliament from 1927 to 1988. Before we continue, I think it's important that we take a moment to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet. And here in Canberra, that is the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people. It's also important that we pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I think it is really important that you keep that acknowledgement in mind throughout this program. As some of you may have visited Canberra before with school groups or with family, you might know that Canberra has, is only just over 100 years old. It's a relatively new city. And before then, it was occupied by Aboriginal people. And they had lived in this land and worked on this land and had families on this land for just over 20,000 years. So whilst we may be familiar with Canberra as a city, as the capital of Australia, that's not the only context through which we can view Canberra. Before Canberra, this place would have looked vastly different. The lake would have been replaced with a simple river that flowed gently through the middle of the valley. And a number of groups lived and occupied the land within this region. The Ngunnawal, the Ngambri and the Narragoo all have sites of significance in this region. In fact, there are over 3,000 sites of heritage value within the Canberra region which support the evidence that these people have lived here for over 20,000 years. Did you know that at the time of European settlement, there were 250 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander language groups that we know of? Today, that number is reduced to 120. You might be curious as to which language groups occupied the land you live in. Why don't we make our way into the building? And on our way in, I'm going to tell you a story. The building was opened by the Duke and Duchess of York on the 9th of May, 1927, before a crowd of excited onlookers. Although, no Indigenous Australians were invited to the ceremony. But two men, Jimmy Clements and his friend John Noble, both were Radjuri men, aged about 80, walked 150 kilometres from the Brungle missions near Gundagai to Canberra in order to witness the opening day. The police spotted Jimmy in the crowd and told him to leave. But the crowd stuck up for this Wiradjuri elder. They told the police to leave him alone. A clergyman in the crowd said Jimmy had as much right to be there as anyone. Jimmy stood his ground. However, Jimmy had made his point and a newspaper article said he was asserting his sovereignty. Jimmy Clements was one of the first of many Indigenous Australians to come into this place and fight for his rights. As we explore more of the building, we will encounter many other pioneers who came here to fight for their rights and freedom. Here we are in King's Hall, the heart of the building. This building is no longer Parliament House. It's now a museum to Australian democracy. Now, some of you may remember from visits in the past with school groups or with your families that democracy comes from the ancient Greek words demos and kratos, people and power. And so in our democracy, the people hold the power. Although we elect our representatives to a Parliament, Australian people still have the power and the many opportunities to make your voice heard. Well, within our democracy, you are guaranteed certain rights and freedoms. And those rights and freedoms can take many forms. They could be the right to assembly, the right to freedom of religion, or the right to freedom of speech. And within our democracy, 
freedom of speech is crucial. But in a 21st century Australia, how do advocates for rights and freedoms and change express their voice? Take 30 seconds and discuss with the person next to you how you can express your voice. In that 30 seconds, I'm sure that many of you came up with a long list of ways that you can express your voice in our democracy. And I'm sure that many of you came up with the concept of social media, Facebook and Twitter, for example. But the politicians and the people who worked in this building, they didn't have social media. So we're going to have to go back in time and throughout our program see how advocates in the past used their voices to affect change. And in order to do that, we're going to have to go into the Senate. So come with me as we head on in. This was the Australian Senate for 61 years. Politicians had many lively debates in this chamber. But it's also incredibly important for another reason. I want you to take a moment and just imagine what it would be like if you were the only person of your gender or race in this chamber. Whilst this chamber may have been used by politicians for decades to have passionate and worthwhile debates, not every element of Australia's society was invited into that discussion. For decades, a complex set of social, economic and political constraints meant that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people were discounted, disempowered or discouraged from joining in the discussions here. Although the government passed voting reforms in 1962 that allowed Indigenous Australians to participate in elections, it wasn't until 1971 that our first federal politician of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander descent was appointed to the Senate. His name was Neville Bonner, and he was a proud Jagera man from northern New South Wales. In the 60s, he worked as a rights advocate, a farmer, and he was eventually a member of the Liberal Party. And it was as a Liberal Party member that he was appointed to represent the state of Queensland in the Senate. Neville Bonner, as a politician, was striving to improve conditions for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders across the country. Throughout his political career, though, he wouldn't just toe the party line, and often he would clash with his own party when it came to matters of conscience. In a formal setting like the Senate, where there are rules and regulations that determine how you're to behave, Neville Bonner found ways to bring his culture into the chamber. In 1976, the Fraser government passed the Aboriginal Land Rights Act. When that was passed, Neville Bonner danced a corroboree dance. A dance that focuses on movement and rhythm to convey meaning. As you can imagine, some senators may have been surprised. Throughout his political career, Neville Bonner faced many challenges within this chamber. He overcame those challenges and was re-elected four times throughout his career. Neville Bonner left Parliament in 1983, although it wasn't until 1998 when the next Indigenous member of Federal Parliament was elected. And since Neville Bonner's time in federal politics, there have been a few prominent Indigenous politicians. Ken Wyatt and Linda Burney are just a couple of examples and they're both recognised as being the first Indigenous members of the House of Representatives. Before we leave this chamber, let's take a moment to consider our parliamentary diversity. Do you think that our parliament is diverse? Or is one group being heard more than another? Which groups might not be being heard in our parliament today? Of course, federal parliament is a crucial part of our democracy and the expression of one's voice, but there are a number of other ways through which you can express your voice and be heard as an advocate for change. 
we're going to leave the chamber now and look at an iconic example of expression of voice. We're here at the roof of Old Parliament House and it's here that we're going to discuss some expressions of voice that have remained a powerful influence throughout Australia's history. Some notable examples of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander expression of voice can be found in 1938 with the Day of Mourning protest held in Sydney and is regarded as being the first Aboriginal protest in Australia's history. Another example is the Wave Hill walk-off in 1966 and both of these examples serve as a blueprint for the protest that you see behind me. And this is the Aboriginal Tent Embassy and it serves as a wonderful example of the expression of voice. The Aboriginal Tent Embassy was established on Australia Day of 1972 following some remarks in a speech given by Prime Minister William McMahon on land rights. Rather than giving traditional ownership back to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, he wanted to establish a lease system. Under his proposed system, traditional owners could only be granted access to their land if they could prove that they could make good economic and social use of the land. The proposal was problematic because it didn't take into consideration Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander views and concepts of the land. And that is that the land is sacred, it is special. In response to this decision, four Aboriginal advocates, Michael Anderson, Billy Craigie, Bertie Williams and Tony Khoury, planted a beach umbrella on the lawns of Parliament House. They held placards that read, Land Rights Now or Else, and they said that until land rights were recognised, they would feel like foreigners on their own land. And because of this, they too needed an embassy. Although the tent embassy started with just four people, it soon swelled to as many as 2,000 people. And they erected tents, they fashioned posters and placards, and they sat peacefully on the lawns in front of Old Parliament House. Unlike Jimmy Clements in 1927, protesters at the tent embassy were eventually removed by police. However, they kept coming back to express their voice and to participate in protest in a democracy. This determination to return to this site and to protest for what they considered to be important is one of the reasons why this protest is one of the longest running protests in Australia's history and is a wonderful example of the many rights that we enjoy within our democracy. Whilst the Tent Embassy was originally established to advocate for land rights, things have changed and over time the Tent Embassy adopted a number of different causes. We're going to head inside now and go downstairs to an office, a very important office, and the occupant of that office had a terrific view of the Tent Embassy from their window. This was the Prime Minister of Australia's office. And it was from this space that a number of Indigenous leaders have come to make their case to our Prime Ministers. Usually the same issue over a number of different Prime Ministers. One of the many Indigenous leaders who came here to campaign for rights was an Arente man called Wenton Rubancha. Wenton led a large protest march through Alice Springs in response to a statement by the Northern Territory Government. The statement in question related to land rights. Following the media attention garnered by this protest, Wenton embarked on a nationwide speaking tour, keeping up pressure on all governments to pursue land rights. Wenton's speaking tour took him all around the country, including here, the nation's capital and parliament house, where he would eventually have a meeting with the Prime Minister Malcolm Fraser. On the day that Wenton arrived here for his meeting with the Prime Minister, he was dressed in worn work trousers and a white shirt that was covered in red dust. He also happened to have with him a bundle of newspapers. Inside the bundle of newspapers was a Chiringa, or a sacred object which Wenton had brought with him as a symbol of his authority to speak with the Prime Minister and to highlight his people's claims to the land. The Chiringa also symbolised another element of importance. The Chiringu was normally only associated with inducted male elders to Wenton's people. You may want to take a moment and just consider what Wenton was trying to achieve by using the Chiringa. How do you think this important gesture might have had an impact on Malcolm Fraser? 
When Wenton revealed the Turinga to Macron Fraser and inducted him into the eldership of his people, he struck a nerve with the Prime Minister. Unbeknownst to Wenton, Malcolm Fraser had his own family history with land rights. Back in the 1930s, when Malcolm Fraser was a young child, he used to enjoy his time at his family's property in New South Wales. As a child, he would roam, he would rove and explore, he would even hunt on his family's property. However, it came time for Malcolm to go to school, and like many farming families, they had decided to send him to boarding school. This meant that Malcolm didn't get to spend as much time at his family's farm. It meant that he missed out on some momentous decisions. In 1943, a terrible drought had struck Malcolm Fraser's family farm, and these family were completely at a loss as to what to do. So they had decided to sell the farm, but no one remembered to tell Malcolm. And it wasn't until Malcolm returned to his family in 1943 that he had found out the farm had been sold. And as he described it, it was the worst day of his life. This powerful little story about Malcolm Fraser and his own little land rights journey highlights just how powerful Wenton's actions with the Turinga and the meeting in 1976 were. Later in 1976, Malcolm Fraser's government would pass the Aboriginal Land Rights Act of 1976. The bill was passed following historic levels of bipartisan support and came into effect on Australia Day of 1977. Of course, these victories might not have occurred if Wenton and other advocates hadn't raised their voice with such fierce determination. Many advocates found, like Wenton, that the use of media was a very effective and powerful tool. Let's head up to the press gallery to find out a little bit more how advocates have used media to express their voice. This is the press gallery overlooking the House of Representatives chamber. It's important for us to have a number of different perspectives within our democracy and that's why we allow the journalists and the media and the press to report on parliamentary proceedings. Throughout our history, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians have often been covered in a negative light by the media. However, they have also found ways to use the media to their benefit. One Aboriginal leader who sought to use the media to effect change was an Arente Kalkadoon man named Charlie Perkins. Charlie Perkins was the first male Indigenous university graduate from the University of Sydney in New South Wales. Whilst studying at university, Charlie noticed that a number of Australians viewed racism as being a problem in other countries like the United States of America or South Africa, but they failed to realise that racism was a problem here. For example, in the small New South Wales towns of Moree and Kempsey, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children were barred from swimming at the local pool. Charlie decided that he wanted to open the Australian public's eyes and start a discussion about what was happening in our own backyard. He took inspiration from protests associated with the US Civil Rights Movement, namely the Freedom Riders. Much like the Freedom Riders in the United States who toured in the Deep South, highlighting segregation and poor treatment of African American people, Charlie wanted to replicate that here by hiring a bus and touring regional New South Wales in most of the towns they came across during their tour, the journalists or the press were there to interview or document their encounters with townspeople. Many non-Indigenous Australians were outraged that this was occurring in their backyard. Later that year, Charlie Perkins would give a speech to over 200 people at an event in Canberra, where he said that this problem is out in the open now. There is no denying that the efforts of Charlie Perkins helped a great deal to convince the broader Australian community and the elected members of Parliament to see Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders in a beneficial and more positive light. We're going to head down into the chamber now to find out how the efforts of advocates have impacted on our political representatives. Here in the House of Representatives is where our political representatives 
undertake the great task of legislating on behalf of us, the Australian public. During the 1960s, the members of this parliament sat here facing increasing pressure to legislate on behalf of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians. However, this was hampered by the fact that an element of our constitution prevents the federal government from legislating on behalf of all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. The constitution even prevented Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians being counted in the census, which means that the population statistics and the funding allocation for states was slightly skewed. It quickly became clear that in order to lift the living conditions for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians, we first needed to fix our constitution. In order to alter the constitution on an issue such as this, the Australian people have to be consulted for a vote in what's called a referendum. People such as Charlie Perkins, Chicka Dixon, Pastor Doug Nicol, or Faith Bandler were critical in this referendum taking place, sending over 90 petitions to Parliament to consider and to encourage them to hold this referendum. Faith Bandler is one of the more important figures associated with the referendum. She was an ardent campaigner of South Sea Islander origin and was one of the most vocal supporters of the Yes campaign. Faith Bandler was passionate about seeing Australia's indigenous people on an equal footing with the broader white Australian community and seeing the Australian people move forward as one people. It was decided here that the Australian people would be consulted on the Aboriginal question and a referendum would be held on the 27th of May, 1967. When it comes to referendums, Australians have a tendency to vote no. In 44 referendums held throughout Australia's history, only eight have ever been passed with a yes vote. And of course, the 1967 referendum has the unique privilege of being one of the highest referendums with a yes vote at 90% of all Australians voting yes. The Australian people had at last acknowledged that Aboriginal Australians counted and that their experiences mattered. Although this was a landmark moment in Australia's history regarding Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians, there was still a lot left to resolve. Equality was not yet achieved and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander advocates still had a lot more to campaign on. However, we cannot forget that the referendum was a highly symbolic and beneficial step in the right direction for equality in Australian history. As we get to the final part of our program today, let's take a moment to reflect. For many years, Government policies had a terrible impact on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians, and many continue to do so today. In response to this, Indigenous advocates campaigned for their voices to be heard and for changes to occur, and they have used a range of different strategies to fight for their rights and freedoms. Some, like Neville Bonner, chose to work within the political system and advocate for change on behalf of their people while some, like Charlie Perkins, chose to advocate outside the political system and use their voice to stir up public interest. Since Parliament left this building in 1988, many major acts of symbolism have occurred. The National Apology to the Stolen Generations was a major moment in Australian history and helped to include Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders in society. However, many Australians still feel that there is much more to be done on the path towards reconciliation. The history that we've learnt and focused on today is very much open to interpretation. And what interpretation you take from this is up to you and based on your personal experiences. However, it's important to realise that much of the history we've discussed today is still living. And it's still important. And there are many people who are invested in the discussion. As you leave here today, give some thought to what you think should be included on the path to reconciliation. 
I hope that you've learned something new today and that you take the time to look at the resources on our website, to look at the characters and the events that we've studied today in more depth. 